Hello everyone, welcome back to our lectures. Once again, Emeka Udenze is speaking. Today we'll be talking about disaccharides and polysaccharides, structure and functions. In fact, uh, this will be the last part of our lecture on carbohydrates. So in this last part, we'll be taking a look at different disaccharides and polysaccharides of importance, and then we'll look at their structure and functions. And I opened the, the title page here, we're showing you the potato I usually buy from uh, Kashankare. This is a couple of potatoes, which is a starch, a starchy food, representing the polysaccharide here. And I have the sugar. My my wife uses the sugar for particularly baking. Um, so this sugar, of course, this is this sugar is a disaccharide. Represents disaccharide. This is a cane sugar. All right, the common table sugar. Let's take it off immediately from there. I have a beautiful quote from. A titan of judiciary, a renowned jurist that just passed um, recently in the United States, Ruth Beda Ginsburg, otherwise called Notorious Arubiji, because of her very revolutionary way of making sure that the world we live in is a better place and then making sure that gender balance becomes a reality in the world we live in. Look at what she has to say. Real change, enduring change, happens one step at a time. And this is true. If you want to bring about a change in whatever you do, just some patience is needed to change a particular system. That is the word coming from Arubiji of the blessed memory. All right, let's immediately start our lectures. Now, the following learning objectives are what we're going to be covering in this class. Number one, we're going to write the reactions for the formation and hydrolysis. We'll form it and break it down. That's what it means. Formation and hydrolysis of disaccharide. We'll describe the uses of important disaccharide and polysaccharide. And we we'll also draw the structures of the structures of important disaccharide and polysaccharide. So we know their uses, we know their structures as well. There are a lot of them, but there are important ones that we encounter every day that will be our main focus in this class. Now, what are disaccharides? Disaccharides are those carbohydrates, we already introduced them, that are made up of two units, two monosaccharides, they are made up of two units of monosaccharide. And they are linked together by the glycosidic linkage. Remember, a glycosidic linkage is either an acetyl or a ketyl bond. Of course, that is exactly what it is. So those linkages are what hold those two monosaccharides together, of course. So if this is a monosaccharide, Combining with another monosaccharide, this becomes the glycosidic linkage. Um, those glycosidic linkages are acetyl or ketyl bonds. So glycosidic linkages are identified. They are designated by the numbers associated with the carbon atoms joining them together. Of course, when two carbohydrates has to join, it has to join from the carbon atoms. They are designated by the numbers of those carbon atoms. And in fact, the configuration, their configuration as well, the configuration of the linkage for the anomeric carbon atom also joining it together also come into place so you identify them by their numbers and then by their configuration the configuration is is the oh group placed above or below remember the two anomeric conf configurations are its alpha and beta configuration that's exactly what we're going to be seeing here let's see what that means now if you look at this structure now i'm going to label this i'm going to try to label this now if i label this now this is one two three four, five, and six. The same thing happens here. If you love this one, this is one, two, three, four, five, and six. Now, these are two alpha. It is alpha. Don't, don't forget. It is alpha because the OH group here is pointing downward. So, both of them are two alpha D-glucose. Now, their joining together will be from the carbon number one of this one to the left and the carbon number four of this one to the left. Now, remember, the carbon number one here the, okay, remember this carbon here, this forms the hemiacetyl carbon. Hemiacet this is the hemiacetyl bond. What that means is that this carbon is the hemiacetyl carbon. This is the hemiacetyl. So, hemiacetyl, therefore, this is the hemiacetyl carbon, which is carbon number one. So, what it means is the carbon number one and carbon number four, this number four is not a hemiacetyl carbon, it's joining together to form this. So when two alpha D glucose join together, they form the maltose. 
look at what is happening every other structure remains the same but the difference is that you are now removing one of this hydrogen and then removing the whole of this oh and joining this to this to form this of course in any of this formation you usually lose what one molecule of water because if you remove this hydrogen and come and put on this one it becomes one molecule of water so when these two join together they form maltose and the configuration of the maltose molecule becomes now both of these were alpha when they started that's why we say it is alpha one four glycosidic linkage so this acetyl acetyl bond is the glycosidic linkage linking this ma, ma, two monosaccharide units of glucose together to form the maltose now so if you want to name it the numbers involved there is number one and four that's why we say you designate them by their numbers and the configuration the configuration here is alpha configuration so you usually start with the configuration of the first one so that's why we say alpha because the first one is alpha and it's going from one to four of this one so that is why maltose is held together by alpha one four glycosidic linkage so this is the formation of disaccharide what about the hydrolysis hydrolysis of course you but you'd have known at this level of our chemistry the hydrolysis is using water, water molecule to break bonds that's exactly what is happening here we're using so the hydrolysis is the opposite of the formation of this disaccharide so if you study this uh, disaccharide you now use water molecule the water molecule comes and breaks this bond as a machete the moment you break this bond what happens the bond breaks from and then one of the remember if you break this bond here one of the hydrogen from the oh will come and join here and the other oh group will come and join here. remember water molecule is always h and oh and what do they form they form two alpha d glucose molecule so this react the fourth reaction here is the formation of the saccharide whereas the opposite reaction here is what the hydrolysis so it's important you know so i can ask you an exam draw the hydrolysis of a disaccharide i cannot ask you draw the formation of disaccharide from two given monosaccharide unit that i decide to give you so this is how we we we, we draw or write the reactions of both the formation of disaccharide and the hydrolysis of a disaccharide now another important point i need to make before we move to the next page is that now the moment remember before we do this reaction remember this also is an acetyl carbon it, the two, the, the two, hemiacetal, the two glucose molecules have hemiacetal groups. When they join together, one of the hemiacetal carbon will now be used to form a glycosidic bond with the number four carbon of the next one. What it means is that in this new one, the only free hemiacetal carbon remaining will be just this one. This will only be the remaining hemiacetal bond carbon here this this is the hemiacetal carbon let me just say carbon carbon and whenever a, a disaccharide has a free hemiacetal carbon what it means is that it is a reducing sugar it can undergo reduction because this particular bond can easily open up into becoming an aldehyde and go into reaction let us immediately take go into the individual monosaccharide individual disaccharide so now we start with the maltose now the reactions that i showed you here is the formation of maltose this is exactly how maltose is formed so maltose is otherwise called the malt sugar it is it contains two glucose units joined together by the alpha one four glycosidic linkage just like i showed in the last page it is commonly found in the germinating grains and also formed during the digestion it's also formed during the digestion of starch particularly in the mouth remember the in the mouth the mouth remains the first point of digestion of starch particularly cooked starch is broken down by the salivary amylase the salivary amylase contain the enzyme sal the salivary the saliva sorry the saliva select secreted by the salivary gland contains the salivary amylase or thialin which breaks down starch actually what it does is that it breaks down cooked starch into into maltose and then some glucose molecules so the enzyme here is the amylase particularly the salivary amylase or what you call the thialin now of course it is a reducing sugar because it contains a hemiacetal carbon very very important to say this remember what we said even after the formation it still has a hemiacetal carbon therefore 
it is a reducing sugar. Now, of course, it gives two molecules of glucose on hydrolysis. If you break it down, it will give you, this is it. If you break it down, it gives you two units, two glucose units. And of course, like I said again, it is a reducing sugar. So now, how, why is it reducing sugar? Remember, this is the maltose molecule. What we have here is the maltose molecule joined together by this alpha-1-2 glycosidic linkage. Now, in solution, it exists predominantly, like we told you, as a cyclic form. But once in a while, because it contains this hemiacetal carbon here, the hemiacetal carbon here, once in a while, opens up to form the aldehyde, aldehyde group. And remember again, reduction is the reduction of uh, of reducing sugar. Sim Sorry, let me let me walk this back. Now, the reaction of reducing sugar to, that makes them reducing sugar is as a result of what the oxidation of the aldehyde carbon into carboxylic acid. Do not forget that. So you add one more oxygen here. This now becomes a carboxylic acid, and that is why we call them reducing sugar. So what it means is that they undergo oxidation by mild reducing agent to become carboxylic acid. And as a result, they do what? They, they are reducing sugar. So important to note that it is a reducing sugar because it has a free hemiacetal group that was not used in the formation of glycosidic linkage. Although it only lost the first one here, but it doesn't, it doesn't lose this one. And as a result, it is a reducing sugar. We now go to the next one, the lactose. Lactose is otherwise called the milk sugar. It is produced in the mammalian mammary gland, particularly in the breast. And it is, of course, an important source of the first food for the infants of the mammals. It is made up of beta-galactose, beta-galactose, beta-d-galactose, and alpha-d-glucose that are joined together by beta-1,4 glycosidic linkage. It is joined together by... It is a reducing sugar because it also contains the hemiacetal carbon. Look at the hemiacetal here, hemiacetal group. So this is the hemiacetal carbon. It is a reducing sugar because the, although the first one has been used. Now remember, look at the look at the bond. The bond, the configuration of the bond is beta one four. What it means is that the first galactose, which is the first monomeric unit, is of the what beta configuration. Look at it now. It is facing up. That is why I have to draw it facing up here. You see the hydrogen is down. That means the OH is facing up. Then link it to this one. Remember, this is glucose molecule. And the, the carbon number four of the glucose molecule has the OH group facing downwards. So that's why this is going downwards and this is going upwards. So this bond is actually our what? This is the beta 1 to 4 glycosidic linkage. Now, so many people cannot, there are a lot of people in the world that cannot actually break down this milk sugar or lactose because they lack the enzyme lactase or beta galactosidate lack the enzyme lactase or you can call it the beta galactosidase what the beta galactosidate does is to break this bone and release these sugars so that the body can absorb it but some people lack these enzymes as a result of some genetic predisposition and as a result they become highly lactose intolerant when they take milk they usually have a lot of abdominal pain, bloating, diarrhea, and even a lot of formation of gas and even nausea. So this is what you need to know about lactose. We now go to the next one, the sucrose. Sucrose is the common table sugar, the common table sugar we use at home for baking and for sweetening and for a lot of other stuff. It is composed of beta fructose, beta deep fructose, and alpha D glucose the two types of sweetest sugars joined together by alpha 1 2 glycosidic linkage now of course it is found in juices of many plants especially the ripe ones that's why they are sweet and it is especially found in sugarcane and sugar beet they remain the greatest sources the sugarcane like the what i showed you the picture i showed you when i start is the cane sugar so the sh sugarcane and sugar beet are just the commonest source of this one particularly that's where they get it they get the source for the industrial production of course it is not a reducing sugar we need to highlight this it is not not a reducing sugar why is it not a reducing sugar because it does not have any free hemiacetal or hemiketal group both hemi hemiacetal group have been used 
to form the what the glycosidic bond. And of course, it is hydrolyzed to produce invert sugar. Invert sugar is a mixture of equal amount of gl glucose and fructose. Invert sugar again is very sweet. Now look at what happens here. Now this is the alpha D glucose. Remember, it's alpha because the OH group is pointing down here. Now this is carbon number one. This is two, three, four, five, and six. Now this is fructose. Fructose is always a furanoside. You know that a furanose rather. Now this is of course this is one. This is two, three, four, five, and six. Now see what happens here. Now you see this is CH two OH is here. That means the OH group is facing up. That's why it's better. So this is better D fructose. This is alpha D fructose. This is better D fructose. This is alpha D glucose. So this bond, this bond particularly now is the alpha one to two glycosidic linkage. Now why is it not a residual sugar? It is not a residual sugar because the anomeric carbon here is carbon number one, and the anomeric carbon here is carbon number two. Both of them have been used to form what? To form this glycosidic bond. Therefore, it is not free for oxidation by oxidizing agent, and therefore sucrose is not a reducing sugar. So if you look at it, both of these anomeric carbons or both of these hemiacetal carbons have been used up. Both of them from the glucose and the fructose have been used up for the formation of this glycosidic bond, and therefore sucrose is the only reduce is the only disaccharide that is not a reducing sugar at the level of this class. Now we we'll start talking about the polysaccharides, the big ones. Now polysaccharides, of course, are otherwise called the glycans. You're going to be hearing a lot of those, the glycans. Now they are formed from the cons con they are condensation polymers containing thousands, thousands of units of monosaccharide. They are not water soluble, although they have a lot of hydroxy group, but their hydroxy groups become individually hydrated when exposed to water. So the highest they actually form is that they form thick colloidal dispersion when they are in water. They just form thick colloidal dispersion because, of course, like I tell you, the carbons are too many. So they would just end up forming a dispersion instead of dissolving in water. Now, there are two classes we're going to be talking about. The homo, homo polysaccharide and the heteropolysaccharide. The homo polysaccharide contain repeating units of the same, look at the word, of the same monosaccharide, the same monosaccharide. So the same type of monosaccharide form them. And good examples we're going to be talking about here is the starch, the glycogen, cellulose, and chitin are all examples of homo because they are made up of, of the same monomeric unit of, mono, the same monomeric unit of monosaccharide. Whereas the heteropolysaccharides are those of them containing repeating units of two different monosaccharide units. So the, their makeup is more than, is not just the same type of monosaccharide. That's why we say they are hetero. So you see two monosaccharide units coming together to form them. And the good examples are heparin, hyaluronate, chondroitin. If you don't want to say hyaluronate, you can say hyaluronic acid, hyaluronic acid. Now, and then the bacterial cell wall polysaccharide is also a very, a very good example, which plays an important role in strength and rigidity and protecting the bacteria. Let's begin to unpack all the stuff we have here. That's what we're going to be doing now. Now, but before we do that, I have something. Properties of different classes of carbohydrate. Let's look at this table. Here, the table has three columns. The first column is the property. Now, the, the monosaccharide and disaccharide properties are a little bit similar, whereas the polysaccharide are much different. So we're going to put it differently. So the, if we come to molecular weight, the molecular weight of monosaccharide and disaccharide is very small. So it's usually very small. It's not very, let's not say very small, but it's small. Whereas that of the polysaccharides are large. So the monosaccharide and disaccharide are just small. These ones are large or even very large because they contain thousands, thousands of glucose of monomeric units of this uh, monosaccharide and disaccharide. Now, what about the test? Now, the test of these guys are sweet. These guys are very, very sweet. Test is sweet. That is one thing we know them for. They are very sweet, whereas these ones are testless, they're polysaccharide. What about the solubility in water? Mon I told you, monosaccharides and disaccharides are very soluble in water, very highly soluble. You can remember when you put your sugar in water, it dissolves completely. They're very soluble. How however, the polysaccharides are insoluble. They only form thick colloidal solution, thick colloid in solution. And that's what they're used in making gravies. What about the particle size? The particle size of these two are so small that they can pass through a filter or a membrane easily, whereas these ones do not pass through 
filters or membrane. They cannot pass through any filter or any membrane. These ones cannot pass through any filter or any membrane. They can they can pass through any filter or any membrane because they are very large. Their molecular weight is very large. Now, what about reducing sugar test? In reducing sugar test, all monosaccharides and disaccharides will become positives. They, are, they test positive. So they test positive except sucrose because the sucrose does not have any free hemiacetal or anomeric carbon. However, polysaccharides generally will always test negative. They will generally become negative for this test. They are not positive for reducing sugar tests. All right. So having said that, we we'll now begin to look at the different or different examples of polysaccharides that we need to talk about. The first one here is starch. So starch is a polymer of, is a polymer consisting of the glucose unit, particularly the alpha D glucose unit. It is the major storage of glucose in plants. It is the major storage of glucose in plant, particularly in some root plants, but like we saw earlier, the tuber plants like potato and yam, the cassava. So it is a very major storage form of glucose in plant. And it's composed of two molecules, two molecules, the amylose, the amylose and the amylo Spectin, the amylose and the amylose, the amylose and the amylose pectin. What is an amylose? Let's look at amylose. Amylose is a linear or unbranched chain. It consists of about 10 to 30 percent of the entire of the entire starch starch, and it's composed of up to 1,000 to 2,000 glucose units that are joined together by alpha one four glycosidic linkage. So it's a linear polysaccharide of glucose. So let's see what happens here. Look at it here. This is a linear, this is glucose joined together by alpha one four. So you can say that if you remember, if you look at this, if you cut from, wait, let me see, this looks like a maltose joined together. That's exactly what it looks like because this is alpha. This is of the alpha configuration one four. This is also alpha one four alpha one four linear, <coughs> which is a linear polysaccharide. So the amylose itself is linear or unbranched and constitute about 10 to 30 percent of the overall starch. And those monosaccharide units are held together by alpha 1 4 glycosidic linkage. On the other hand, what about amylopectin? Let's look at uh, amylopectin and what, what amylopectin is all about. Now, amylopectin, on the other hand, is not linear. It is a branched chain which constitutes more. It, that you have more amylopectin than amylose. So it has about 70 to 90 percent of starch itself is amylospectin and it has since it's branched it has a linear structure just like it has a linear structure that looks like the amylose but also have the branch point so it has it it has a linear structure at that it, that are held together by a for one four glycosidic linkage and also a branch point held together by a for one four glycosidic linkage let's look at this picture. Now, now, this one looks like the amylose, which is the normal linear chain, held together by alpha 1 4. This is also alpha 1 4. This is also alpha 1 4 glycosidic linkages here. This is the glycosidic linkage. This is a glycosidic linkage, glycosidic, glycosidic. However, it has branch point. Branch point is now it's like having another amylose on top, but this time this amylose here will connect to this. So you find that this carbon, or this dynamic carbon, of course, this is hemiacetal carbon forms a bond with the cyst carbon. Remember, the carbon that is protruding up here is the cyst one, which it forms bond with this one. So if you count this one, one, two, three, four, five, six. This is the sixth one. So this alpha one four linkage is the branch point. So it has both the linear and the branch point. And there are more amylose, there are more amylopectin than amylose in start because it's constitute about 70 to 90% of starch now starch itself has starch itself has an inter a characteristic test that we usually do in the lab and in fact we're going to be coming across this in your labs so it's the test for the presence of starch so the reaction between iodine solution and and starch 
is as a result of the amylose component of star. The amylose forms a helix whereby the the two no, the amylose forms a helix whereby the glucose molecule fits in the glucose molecule goes into fitting fitting there as a rod inside it to form so the complex between the amylose helix and this is what forms the blue black coloration that is encountered in iodine test iodine test for the presence of starch the iodine test so it's an iodine okay it's iodine test for starch so the reaction between iodine solution and the coiled amylose gives a bluish black some people call it dark black dark black color so the product consists of an amylose helix just as i showed you this is amylose helix filled with iodine inside this is now the iodine molecule this is the i2 molecule so the dark bluish color is the characteristic result when a solution of iodine reacts with starchy foods like potatoes and cookies. And do you know what happens? I did that. This is what I did in my house. So this is a potato. So this is a potato I bought. I showed you part of the video when I bought it. Now I did this picture myself. That's why it has my name. So if you if you drop the you know the color of iodine. Now if you drop it and leave it for some time, find out it forms really black. See how this is really black or bluish black coloration. This is the characteristics to tell you that the presence of starch in this slice or slice of potato. The same thing happens here. This is my Graham cookies, which I also dropped some few drops of iodine. And it also formed the blue black coloration. The blue black coloration. Or you can say black, whichever, or dark blue. I like calling it blue black. Blue black color as well. So this is what particular what you see and what is the importance of this this the importance of this particular test is that it is used to quantitatively monitor the hydrolysis of starch particularly in the in the lab or maybe in the industries as well so it's an important characteristics for the presence of starch particularly in the lab and you're going to be doing this particular lab by the time you will start talking about carbohydrates in time so this is the one i now drew so this is the one i use the computer to draw so the molecular conformation of the amylose iodine complex remember now this is the amylose helix forming those helix and the iodine molecules now go and fit inside it it is this complex the whole of this complex that brings about that bluish black color that is characteristics of the presence of starch all right we'll now go to the next one the glycogen the glycogen is of course otherwise called the animal starch because it is the storage form of alpha the glucose in the body so it is made up of the polymer of glucose unit and is used by animals to store glucose especially in the liver and in the muscle it is mainly stored in the liver and a few other ones can be seen in the muscle of course it is structurally similar to amylopectin the structure of glycogen is exactly the same thing as the structure of amylopectin and this is exactly the structure what it means is that it has a linear polysaccharide that is connected by alpha 1 4 and a branch point and at alpha 1 6 this is the branching this is the linear remember this is the branch point this is the branch point and this is the linear point now the difference between amylopectin and glycogen is that glycogen is more branched it is it has an extensive branching has an extensive branching than the amylopectin. It is far more highly branched. Now that makes sense because cells are small and most of this molecule that will be inside them has to be very branched and condensed to, so that they can fit into these cells. All right, we now go to the next one, cellulose. Cellulose, of course, is the most abundant organic compound on earth. The most abundant, found everywhere. Now, it's a polymer of, in this case, is a polymer of beta-D glucose. It is the polymer of beta-D glucose, not alpha. The last ones we talked about have been alpha. This is beta-D glucose unit. And like I said again, it is found in plant cell walls, particularly where they provide strength and rigidity for the plant. Now, it is a linear polysaccharide. 
like the Amylos. But in this case, Amylos has alpha 1, 4. Here, it has beta 1, 4 glycosidic linkage. And because of it is a beta configuration, it is not easily digested by humans. It can only be digested by ruminants. Ruminants are uh, a set of animals that have four chambered stomach. And part of the stomach is the rumen. The rumen is the part of the stomach that actually stores the cellulose for a while. And the rumen contains some bacteria that help in those digestion. So most of these animals that do this actually chew cord, like the cattle, the horse, the goat, and all the rest of them. They can do this, but humans cannot do this at all. Humans cannot do this at all. So like I said, the cellulose itself is found in plants. Now, I went to a park and took this picture. This is an example of a tree, a plant. So that is where they are found, actually. So this is, again, my picture that I, I had to take to do this, you know. So they are found in the plant. And like I said, they are the most abundant organic matter, organic compound on earth. Now, now look at their structure. Like I said, this, this is the structure. Now, this is, remember, since this is down, therefore, the OH group is up. If it is up, this is a beta configuration. Remember, this bond is beta 1, 2, 4 glycosidic bond. And it, because it's in a beta configuration, the human beings cannot digest this thing because most of the enzymes we have are the enzymes that are of the alpha configuration. So that is why the humans does not, humans do not break this bond easily. So this is the structure of cellulose as well so it is the polymer of beta glucose itself not alpha glucose now let's go to the next one chitin chitin is a linear homopolysaccharide of course that has all the residue linked together again just like the starch the residue are joined together by beta 1 4 glycosidic bond now the only difference between this and starch is that whereas starch is made up of beta d glucose here, the chitin is made up of N-acetyl beta-D glucosamine, which we call the amino sugars. They're actually made up of the amino sugar. Okay, look at the amino sugar. Let me show you first before I talk about other things. Now, this is a glucose molecule completely. So in a glucose molecule, this carbon, if I count one, two, three, four, five, six. The carbon number two here has been replaced. The OH group has been replaced by an amino group. That's what we call this an amino sugar. So the name of this is alpha because this is alpha, remember? Alpha D glucosamine. This is an amino sugar. Now, if you connect this amino group with an acetyl group again, you now form an acetyl glucosamine. So chitin itself is a the monomeric unit is what? The N acetyl glucosamine. Actually, the shortcut is NAG. N acetyl glucosamine, the shortcut is N acetyl glucosamine NAG. So it is made up of the monomeric unit of NAG. So it is the major structural component of the exoskeleton of invertebrates, such as the insect and the crustaceans. And some cell walls of algae, the fungi and yeast are made up of these as well. And in fact, a good example I have here is crab. You know, crab is a crustacean. You see, that hard shell that protects it is made up of what? The chitin. The chitin is self. Now, look at it. Let's see. Look at the structure. So, look at the first. So, this is n acetic glucosamine, the two monomeric unit. Remember, it will keep joining itself with other ones and forming more large polymers. Now, these are two molecules of n acetic glucosamine. Like I told you, it is beta because this is down. Therefore, the OH group is going to be up. That's what this is a beta configuration. Now, this is the amino, amino group. The amino group is connected to acetyl group that's why we say it's n acetyl glucose i mean and since it's in a better configuration you have to put that it becomes okay here it's going to be beta n acetyl beta d glucose i mean both of them is in the beta configuration so it's important we know this now we're not going to talk about start talking about heteropolysaccharide like i told you the heteropolysaccharide are those ones that are made up of different repeating units of monosaccharide and the first class we're going to be talking about are the glycosaminoglycans glycosaminoglycans or gags now they are type of polysaccharide that are based on 
repeating disaccharide unit in which one of the sugar is at least at least one sugar will have a negative charge due to the presence of a sulfate or carboxy group and then the other sugar will be an amino sugar so it has one of the sugar is an amino sugar like, just like we saw here amino sugar here this is an amino sugar this is an amino sugar then and the other sugar is going to be must have a negative charge because of the presence of a sulfate or carboxylic group remember that so they're going to be charged and that is why they retain water and they, they perform very important function as part of the connective tissue there are a few of them we're going to look at there is the heparin heparin has a high negative charge it has a high negative charge and it is used as a natural anticoagulant particularly in the hospitals as well then hyaluronic acid or hyaluronate are the components of the vitreous humor of the eye and the synovial fluid which is synovial fluid which is the lubricant fluid of the body's joint the the the, the lubricant of the joint the, the joint particularly if you have where you have your kneecap and your bones joining together they form that lubricant that make the bone to move easily not to bring wear and tear on each other when you move when you do your movement and then there is this chondroitin and the keratin sulfate that are found in tendons they are also found in cartilages and other connective tissue and then the dermatin sulfate which is a component of the extracellular matrix of the skin even from the name you can see dermatin sulfate so these are few examples of these glycosaminoglycans that i want you to just know and know what at least their functions and i have two structures of just the two of them two of them have their structures represented the heparin and hyaluronic acid so look at the heparin they say we remember one of the this thing is that the heparin has a lot of negative charge let's see heparin is made up of the first monomeric unit is d glucoronate 2 sulfur let's see the carbon here the the carbon number six has been replaced by has been oxidized to carboxylic acid and here a carboxylate so it's charged and then look at this one the carbon number two here now has a sulfate group that is charged again that's why we say it is glucoronate two sulfate so this glucose if you remove this it becomes glucuronic acid if you remove let me go to this if you remove this one now it becomes glucuronic acid because this is already carboxylic acid and then if you add this that's why i say glucuronate two sulfate and is of the D configuration. Of course, this is up. And then the second monomer is this one. Now, this one is N sulfur because you see the certain group here has been replaced by a sulfur. That's why it says N sulfur D glucosamine because it has an amino group here, six, and there's a sulfur group. Again, it has a charge here and charge. So if you look at the total number of charge, it has six charged groups. So it is very highly chart this is what we call heparin and heparin is an important word heparin is an important anticoagulant then what about the hyaluronic acid or you say hyaluronate you know if it is not charged you say hyaluronic acid but it's charged here because i don't have the hydrogen here it's just like the acid that have lost its hydrogen so again so this is deglucoronate because this is just half this is only in glucose the only thing that happened here is that the carbon the alcohol group in this carbon number C has been oxidized to carboxylic acid so this is deglucoronate so deglucoronate is is connected to n acetic glucosamine remember the n acetic glucosamine the one we saw in chitin so this n acetic glucosamine connected again by this is this will be beta 1 3 so do you remember just to let you know there's no carbon here i tried to draw this to make it a curve within comma there's no carbon here so it is the connection between this place and this number three actually here so this number three and this one is connected together but this three to this oh group is placed inside because it's also of the beta configuration at this point so that's why we say this is what so this is again this is beta one three that is connecting the hyaluronic whereas here is what the alpha if you see this one now you see this is going down therefore this will be the alpha one four connecting these two in heparin so these are just the common two st common structures of the two of them i want you to at least recognize but most importantly you have to know the functions of those glycos amino glycans that, that i have listed here now we now go to the last but not the least of what we need to talk about here the peptidoglycans 
Peptidoglycans are also another class of um, another class of heteropolysaccharide that is the major component of the bacterial cell wall. In fact, it provides strength and rigidity for the bacteria because the bacteria itself, bacteria needs protection against the harsh or variable osmotic environment, particularly when you take your antibiotics and do all that is because they live in the host cell. So this particular part of the of the poly polysaccharide provides that rigidity, that strength and rigidity to overcome such a variable environment and maintain its shape, its size, and prevent swelling or shrink shrinkage that could accompany various solutions of high osmolarity osmolarity strength, particularly in the host. So it is made up of the repeating unit of polysaccharide that consists of two different residues held together, of course, by beta-1,4 glycosidic linkages. Now, what are the units? Now, the first unit is, now, depending on where you are coming from, if I come from here, the first unit here is N-acetyl glucosamine. I already talked about this. This is N-acetyl glucosamine because here there's there is what? An amino group and there's an acetic group. Okay, that is too thick. Yeah. So, so this is what makes it N acetic glucosamine. Now, N acetic is connected to another type of gluc another type of monosaccharide. In this case, it is called N acetyl muramic acid. In muramic acid, look at what happened. You have your N acetic glucosamine like here, but the carbon number three is connected to propanoic acid from carbon number two. That's exactly, if you count this one, Two, three. So this propanoic acid, if you connect it to carbon number two here, through this oxygen here, it forms an acetyl muramic acid now. So here, the, the, the monomeric unit of this bacterial cell wall is an acetyl muramic acid now connected by alpha, no, not alpha, beta 1,4 glycosidic bond to an acetyl glucosamine. Remember, this bond, of course, is going to be the beta 1 to 4 glycosidic linkage. And like I said again, this provides that strength and rigidity and protection needed for what? Bacteria to survive in the host cell by reinforcing the bacteria cell wall. And having said that, we've come to the end of this lecture. Thank you once again for listening. Bye.